Uh, Deputy O'Brien. Thank you, Ken Kurland. Uh, first of all, can I thank um, all of the contributors to, to the debate? I think the level of a number of speakers is an indication of uh, the importance that this um, subject and, uh, and education and the upcoming budget is to everyone on all sides of the House. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for their contribution. Uh, Minister, you quite rightly pulled us up last night on the figures we quoted in relation to the OECD. And, um, the figure you quoted um, is from 2010 as well, so that figure in itself is almost three years old. And I think given the level of cuts which we have seen over the last number of years, you know, we could spend uh, another hour debating what the actual spend uh, in relation to our GDP is on education. But I think the bigger question is, uh, is what we're investing in education being directed to the right places? Is it tackling educational disadvantage? Is it improving our educational outcomes? Are we getting value for money? And that's the bigger debate that we need to have, whether it's in this chamber or in committee, that is the debate that needs to happen. And let's move away from the stats and get down to the nuts and bolts of it. Okay, well then we look forward to debating that in committee. Uh, Minister, in your own amendment last night, I want to quote one of the lines. And you said, education services have been protected despite the immense challenges posed by the financial uh, um, difficulties of our nation. Now, Minister, I don't even believe that you um, would believe that that's a credible statement. I mean, how can anyone say that our education services have been protected, given that in 2012 we took 132 million out of education. Last year we took 77 million out of education. And this year we're, we don't know how much we're going to be taking, but we're talking possibly anything up to 100 million, almost 300 million in three years. And for anyone, and particularly for a minister to state that um, education services have been protected despite that level of cuts is just being disingenuous. Now, Minister, you said last night that we needed to inject an element of realism into this debate. So let's just do that. And the reality is on the ground that education is being dismantled cut by cut. Just look at some of the uh, measures that have been brought in since you came to office. The change in staffing schedules for small schools, cuts in maintenance grants, increase in student contribution fees, scrapping of the minor work grants, changes to school transport schemes, changes in PTR, loss of guidance counsellors, cuts in further education, and then on top of all that, we have a teaching population which is becoming increasingly demoralised. That's the reality on the ground, Minister. Now, we're about three weeks away from the budget, and you yourself, Minister, we don't even know how much we're going to have to save within the education budget. And that leads to the question, you know, how does the department, or how do you as minister and your junior ministers, how do you plan ahead? How do you look at the long-term strategic um, plan that we want to put in place for education if we don't even know the types of savings that you have to implement yet? And the reality is you're going to get a figure over the next three weeks. You're going to make a number of decisions. In my opinion, some of those decisions are going to be rushed because we don't know the exact figure that's needed. And that, for me, just brings into focus the need for budget-proofing our announcements. And I know Deputy McLaughlin produced legislation before the summer recess that would give effect to that. Because we've seen the consequences of announcements from your own department over the last two budgets and the fact that there haven't been any impact analysis being done in them and then decisions haven't been to be reversed. And in fairness, you know, you have taken on board the views and you have made those uh, changes. But one of the areas in your speech last night that you gave a lot of focus and attention to was in relation to DESH. And you lauded this, the success of the DESH program. And I want to quote what you said last night. You said, retention rates in disadvantaged schools have improved due in large part to the support offered through the DESH Action Plan for Educational Inclusion. Retention rates for DESH second level schools have increased by almost 12% over a five year period between pupils who have entered second level in 2001 and those who entered in 2006. There is clear evidence that the DESH program is having a positive effect in tackling educational disadvantage and is an example of funding well spent. The last line, clear evidence that the DESH program is having a positive effect in tackling educational disadvantage 
it is, a, it is an example of funding well spent. Yet, in your first budget, Minister, you want to dismantle the DASH program. No, I want to take out some of the extra you, 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 you went after You went after a program which, in your own words last night, was, was having a positive effect in tackling educational disadvantage and was an example of funding well spent. Now, Minister, it's those type of decisions are going to be made in previous budgets and this budget until we get to a situation where there is actually an impact analysis done of every budgetary decision, and that's what needs to happen in relation to this. You also um, spoke about the higher education sector, and again I just want to quote what you said last night, Minister. You said, the department supports a range of measures which facilitate greater levels of participation by disadvantaged students. The principal support in financial terms is provided under the student grant scheme and approximately 42% of students in full-time higher education in the 2011-12 academic year were in, were in receipt of this student grant. Now, there are noble words indeed, Minister, but again, in your own words, let, let's inject some realism into the debate. And we heard today at the Education Committee from St. Vincent de Paul, who said that even those students who are receiving the full maintenance grant are finding it increasingly difficult to stay in college. Now, this government took a decision to cut the maintenance grant, and that has put more pressure on students to stay in college. And it's estimated that one in 12 students from a disadvantaged background are being forced to drop out of higher education because they just cannot afford it. Even those students who are, uh, uh, who are lucky enough to avail of a full grant are still having to drop out because of financial pressures. So, Minister, cutting maintenance grants is only entrenching educational inequalities in this state, and that needs to be taken on board. In relation to the PTR, Minister, you said in your own amendment, which you put forward last night, and I quote, the protection by this government of the standard pupil-teacher ratio in primary schools and free post-primary schools since taking office. And in theory, that is correct. In theory. But again, let's inject some realism into the debate. The, the reality on the ground is that class sizes are increasing because the student population is increasing. And therefore, we have more students being going into classes. One in four students at primary level are in classes of more than 30 plus. I quoted uh, an, in, uh, uh, an example of in my own county of Cork last night where one primary school class has 41 students. Now, a great amount of effort and focus was done at primary level on changes in the curriculum to an activity-based module. And the reality on the ground, Minister, is that when you have that many students in a class, and many of these classes are small classrooms, they don't have the capability, the teachers don't have the capability, uh, and are under severe pressure to actually teach that activity-based curriculum. Um, and that is the reality on the ground, Minister. In relation to post-primary, the changes in the career guidance councillors and the system in terms of moving it from ex quota to in quota was in effect for many, many post-primary schools an increase in PTR. That's just the reality on the ground again, Minister. So while it's all well and good to say that we haven't touched PTR in primary and post-primary, the reality on the ground is a different story, Minister. And in relation to the uh, changes in the career guidance system, we've seen the recent reports where the level of one-on-one -on -one um, interaction between councillors and students has decreased by almost 50%. And that is a significant loss, a very important and vital, um, um, I suppose, way of students being able to access the uh, services that they need. If I want to touch briefly, Minister, because uh, I know I'm running out of time, on the back to school costs. And there is no doubt, Minister, we've seen report after report from Bernardo's and various other um, groups in relation to the increasing costs for sending students back to school. Now, of course, it's not your department. We've seen cuts in the, the back to school flooding and footwear loans, which has even put more pressure on parents. And the situation is quickly, quickly getting out of hand from many, many parents, Minister. And in my opinion, Minister, you've taken a very hands-off approach in this area. And I say that for a number of reasons, because instead of using the powers which you have under legislation, Minister, to direct schools to introduce things like generic school uniforms, I mean, you have that power, Minister, 
to issue those directives. You have decided to go down the road of encouraging parents' associations and parents' councils to work with school boards of management and um, the patron groups to try and address the issue. Now, Minister, that's all well and good, but if that doesn't happen, then, you know, I would encourage you to step in and to use the powers that you have under the Education Welfare Act. And you have those powers, and I saw you consulting. I share your concern. I'm not sure that I have that part. You have those powers, Minister, because I've checked it out with the Library Research Unit in here, and we've got a paper back which states categorically that you have the powers to implement those directives to school. And in fact, I think the previous Education Minister, or the last thing it was done was in 2001, when the uh, then Fianna Fáil Education Minister actually issued directives in relation to school uniforms to patron bodies. So you do have that power, Minister. Um, now, Minister, I have been very complimentary of you in relation to a number of initiatives that you have brought forward. I mean, we have debated three significant pieces of legislation in the QQI, the ETB and the FET bills, which have huge potential to transform the education system in this state. Huge potential, and I've congratulated you on, on those pieces of legislation. But there's a number of other progressive measures which you have ambitions to achieve as well, such as the reform of the junior cycle. You published the action plan on bullying, and literacy and numeracy strategy, all very laudable aims, Minister. But the reality is those reforms will mean nothing if you continue to cut education budgets. Because unless you put in place the resources to implement those reforms, those reforms are going to sit on the shelf somewhere. And that is going to be, you know, it, it's going to be a devastating um, consequence of the situation we find ourselves in now. We are squandering the opportunity to implement real reform, Minister, unless we match it with the resources and the finances. Now, Minister, I don't lay all the responsibility for this at your feet. There has to be a collective responsibility of Cabinet in when it comes to investing in education. I don't understand the way this government works where the Minister for Public Expenditure and the Minister for Finance comes into the Cabinet table and he wags a finger at each individual Minister and he says, you have to find X amount of savings within your department and off you go now and try to find them. There is no joined up thinking when it comes to Cabinet in relation to the type of society we want, the type of education system we want, the type of health system we want, the type of mental health services we want to put in place. And as long as this government continues to operate in a very departmental way and role of every minister being given X amount to, to find, then we're never going to get on top of the real issues facing society, Minister. So I think Cabinet needs to make a decision collectively. They need to come out collectively and say that we need to invest in our education system. And because we collectively want to invest in education, because we collectively, as a government, want to cherish all of the children of this nation equally, we are not going to cut our education budget. And that is the only way that this can happen. It happened in the North, when we have cross-party support for redirecting almost 400 million back into education. It's happened in other countries, where political parties from left and right have come together and have said education is critically important to the economic recovery of our country and therefore we are making a decision to protect education. Now, Minister, I have a minute and a half left and I just want to say there is no easy and hard decisions, and I said this last night, in my opinion, there are no hard or easy decisions when it comes to education. There are right decisions and there are wrong decisions. Now, Minister, cutting education budgets is not a hard decision. It's simply the wrong decision. And investing in education, even in these difficult economic times, as hard as that may be, is not just something that we can stand up and say is something that can easily be done. But it can be done, Minister. We have shown how it can be done. We've, and we will show again how it will be done when we launch our pre-budget submission in uh, the week after next. And it's not an easy decision, but it is the right decision, Minister. It is the right decision to invest in education. We will reap the benefits for years to come. We only have to look at countries like Finland, where the Education Committee in this Oireachtas went and visited in February of uh, this year. And we looked at the system which is in place in Finland. And the difference between Finland and here 
similar populations, similar pupil numbers, is that they made a decision in a time of recession to invest in education and they are reaping the benefits now. Thank so, you. Minister, I would implore you to go back to Cabinet and to convince your Cabinet colleagues that an investment in education is well worth doing.